And unfortunately, I'm going to have to read to you tonight because my memory is not what it used to be. The great nebula in Orion generally considered the finest example of a diffuse nebula in the sky and one of the most wonderfully beautiful objects in the heavens is a, in a moderately large telescope. Its appearance is impressive beyond words and draws exclamations of delight and astonishment from all who view it. This great glowing irregular cloud shining by the gleaming light of the diamond-like stars entangled in it makes a marvelous spectacle which is unequaled anywhere else in the sky. Barnard found it resembling a great ghostly bat as it came drifting into the field of the Yerkes telescope. Imagine that. What is it, a 30? Oh, come on, what happened? I didn't do it. Wow, what the hell? Thank you. Imagine looking through, what is it, the 34 inch Yerkes telescope and having the old Ryan Nebula drift into the screen. And he spoke of a feeling of awe and surprise each time he saw it. To many others, it creates as does no other a vista of the heavens, the single overpowering impression of primeval chaos and transports the imaginative observer back to the days of creation. This irresistible impression is more than a poetic fancy as modern astrophysics now confirms for the Orion Nebula is undoubtedly one of the regions in space where star formation is presently underway. For the amateur, there is no other object in the heavens so perfectly suited for observation by low power wide angle telescopes. The night should be dark and clear, of course, the eyes well dark adapted. A dramatic way to appreciate the extent of the nebulosity is to set the telescope just ahead of the nebula and allow it to drift slowly across the field. With this method, the glow of the nebulosity may be traced out far beyond the usual limits. That's from Burnham's Celestial Handbook. The detail visible in the Orion Nebula is truly spectacular. Here is one of the few sights in the sky that when seen through modest amateur telescopes, impresses even those not excited by astronomy. The intricacy is beyond description, and even after hundreds of hours viewing this nebula, it still remains a beautiful and wondrous sight. The Great Nebula in Orion has a really large brightness range. The difference between the brightest part of the nebula, which is sort of at the right side, and then the faintest part of the nebula, which is huge and behind it. The brightest part in, in the following photographs is completely devoid of detail. So the photograph can show the fainter parts of the nebula. So this is also from um, Burnham's Celestial Handbook. And you'll notice how nice it shows all the nebulosity behind it, um, but the the fish mouth, the little part that comes in there, um, everything around it doesn't have any detail in it at all. And here's another version from uh, Malice, um, the Messier handbook, a color photograph. And the nebulosity shows beautifully, um, but you don't see the detail in what's called the trapezium. Um, my cursor doesn't work at home, so come to the meeting. Um, the trapezium is right in there, and I'll be showing you details of that. So um, the following two pictures use sophisticated masking techniques, and they are used to allow us to see both the brightest parts of the nebula and the faintest parts. I should say that the human eye can easily see both the brighter parts and the fainter parts. We, we can see that when we look at the brighter part, our pupil stops down a little, we see more detail. 
and under good skies, we will see the fainter part. But trying to photograph them, you just saw what happens. The bright part is burned up if the exposure is long enough to show the detail. So there are sophisticated masking techniques in photography that allow us to see both the brightest parts of the nebula and the faintest parts. So this is probably the ultimate photograph of the Orion Nebula. It's done by the Hubble Space Telescope. You saw in the, in the photographs how this area was completely blown out. This is called the trapezium. There's four stars and more depending on your telescope there. But look at what they're able to pull out of all the nebulosity. Um, all these incredible details. It's, it's an astounding image and it offers a lot of information, um, but it's not gonna look like that through our telescopes. And here's another version by an amateur and that's not bad, um, but you can see all kinds of nebulosity I like to think of this as a fish, and then this is the fish mouth, but all that blue nebulosity and all the red, it's a magnificent photograph, but what we see doesn't look like it at all. So this is about what do we see, what can we look for when we're observing it? So I'm showing you a drawing because that, shows more what the human eye looks like um, as opposed to seeing a photograph. This is an astounding drawing by uh, an astronomer named Truvalo. Does anybody remember his first name? Okay. Um, Leopold. He came over to Harvard, I think, for a year and used their 15-inch refractor and did a lot of observing. And he did a series of... of I don't know what these are, whether they're watercolors or whatever, but what a magnificent drawing. Um, and I've seen original prints. This is kind of a funny story, but the Antique Telescope Society went out to Carleton College and a whole bunch of guys that know everything about the history of astronomy and the, prof and the astronomer was showing them around, the head of the department, and he said, yeah, that, that's a door. It's like a hidden door to the attic. And all these guys, their eyes light up. And they said, the attic, can we go in the attic? So everybody rushes in. There's not a lot of stuff there, but there's some old crates. And it says from Mount Wilson Observatory. And I forget the name of the astronomer who was on it, but somebody famous. And then people were looking around and somebody said, what are those framed pictures over in the corner? And they pulled out this framed picture and they are original Truvalo, well, reproductions, original Truvalo reproductions. Um, if you go home, do a Google for Truvalo. I'll try and come up with his first name and I'm sorry that I forgot it. Leo and Cole. they're just magnificent drawings and paintings of the night sky. And you've never seen anything like that, but they're, they're magical. The other minor problem with Truvalo is he brought some gypsy moths with him from England to do some experimenting. And of course he kept them all carefully locked up so that they wouldn't get loose in the United States. Something happened. He was the guy that introduced the gypsy moth to the United States. But this is more like what you will see um, when you observe Orion in a telescope um, under really dark skies. So here's the thing, I'm gonna show you some more drawings, but when I saw this right angle in the drawings, it's like, come on, there's not like right angles in nebulae. I, I thought that was just fanciful. And you'll see some of these drawings are incredibly fanciful. But I, I said, I don't know why they draw that because there can't be, I mean, a perfect right angle. So here's the story. Um, from a book called The Astronomical Scrapbook, which is a gold mine of short columns all put together by Joseph, written and put together in this book by Joseph Ashbrook. Um, I found all kinds of wonderful things um, 
in here that were projects that we did, some observing and sketching pro, uh, projects and so on. Um, it's a gold mine. And so this article on the visual Orion Nebula came from Joseph Asbrook's astronomical scrapbook, and you can still buy them used and some um, in excellent condition. A note on the orientation of the Orion Nebula. So this is an image by Chuck Manges, who I found on the internet, and it's not uncommon to see the Orion Nebula look like that, only that's incorrect in terms of the way it, it is positioned in the night sky. So here are the three stars of Orion's belt, Mintaka, Al Nilan, and Al Natak. And um, then here's the Orion sword. And you'll notice that the brightest part of the Orion Nebula is facing Orion's belt. So actually his photograph should have been that way. So it's gonna be a little bit confusing because with a number of the drawings, I've tried to turn them so that the fish mouth is sort of painting. I mean, that's it's looking west, but so that the fish mouth is on the top of the nebula. Um, but you'll see some where it's different than that. The introduction of a powerful new observing technique often ends a chapter on astronomical history. This happened when Henry Draper took the first successful photograph of the Great Orion Nebula on September 30th, <coughs> excuse me, 1880, a 57-minute exposure with the 11-inch Clark refractor of his private observatory at Hastings on Hudson, New York, yay, New York State. He soon followed this picture with others of 104 and 10 and 137 minutes of exposure. Wouldn't it be cool if you could have an 11 inch Clark in your backyard? Of course, not on Long Island because the light pollution so bad. So there's the very first photograph by Henry Draper of the Orion Nebula, 1880. And in 1882, he did this one uh, with a longer exposure. And now that begins to look like something that we're familiar with. He soon followed this picture with others of longer exposure, which showed clearly the vast wreaths and swirls of luminous gas so familiar to us on modern photographs of this splendid object. These pictures and similar ones taken by A.A. A. Common in England brought to a close a long period during which many of the world's best known astronomers spent enormous labor in mapping visually the details of Messier 42. Once it was abandoned, this work of sketching and drawing soon became nearly forgotten. Yet it has interest for present day amateurs whose views of the nebula match the best of the old drawings more closely than recent photographs where the bright inner parts are heavily overexposed. The discover the, this is not chiseled in stone. Uh, I've heard the discovery uh, listed with others, but it says here, the discovery of the Orion Nebula was long attributed to Christian Huygens in 1656, using a two and one third inch non-achromatic refractor. The Dutch astronomer that year made the earliest known drawing of the object. This crude depiction was published in his 1659 book about Saturn. Um, while other such well-known observers as Charles Messier and J.A. Schroeder devoted much attention to the Orion Nebula toward the end of the 18th century, the scientific study of it really began only with John Herschel in the 1820s. 
One reason for the delay lies in the history of printing. For until the invention of lithography with a you know dot dot images, which could give you a grayscale, um, and lithography was invented around 1800, there was no really satisfactory way to reproduce drawings of the nebula. The old woodcuts and etchings could not represent the soft texture and range in surface brightness, and so they were inaccurate and misleading. With a wood block. You, you have a level block and you carve out where you don't want the ink and then you ink it with a roller and put it under pressure on paper. So you get either all the ink or no ink and uh, lithography involves uh, taking the picture and turning it into tiny, tiny dots like 85 dots per inch or 90 dots per inch. And those dots are different sizes. It's a photographic process. So if you have a bunch of big dots close together, you have a dark tone. And for a very light gray, you have very tiny dots very far apart. So since they couldn't reproduce what they saw, um, it wasn't really worth publishing. One consequence was a widespread 18th century belief that the nebula undergoes large and rapid changes in its overall appearance. This is a, a drawing by Charles Messier in 1771, and he's showing uh, some of the stars, although the, the positions are, are very rough. In 1826, Herschel, he did not become Sir John until 1831, reported to the Royal Astronomical Society a careful study of the Orion Nebula. He used the 18 and a quarter inch reflector of 20 feet focal length that he had built in 1820 under the supervision of his aged father, William. The usual magnification was about 150 obtained with a single lens eyepiece. This is astounding. Herschel writes, nebulous matter, John Herschel conjectured with surprising foresight and this was in 1820, was probably a self-luminous or phosphorescent material substance in a highly dilated or gaseous state, but gradually subsiding by the mutual gravitation of its molecules into stars and sidereal systems. In 1820, he figured that this was a star birth area. Um, and what's astounding is that's that's his photograph. Um, and I made a um, his goal for m forty two was to make it as accurate enough for future astronomers to determine if the nebula had changed over time. He began by plotting the brighter stars by measuring their relative separations with a micrometer fitted to a small microscope. He laid them out in a fashion like a surveyor of his time would measure a plot of land. So each star would be accurately placed in relation to its neighbors in a series of interacting, interacting triangles. He called this a skeleton <clears throat> and his descriptions of this technique make it clear that it was a terribly difficult process. Um, to make, learn more about the nature of the nebula would require detection of evolutionary changes. So I, I read about the careful uh, drawing. Um, and this is a negative of that. I thought that might be interesting um, to flip it into a negative. Um, so, uh, his drawings uh, were prepared from sketches and notes say, taken on several favorable nights and was afterward compared with the sky and corrected. <clears throat> Amateurs today may still find use for the, for the largely forgotten set of names that Herschel introduced in 1826 for the main features of the Orion Nebula. 
This nomenclature is shown in the chart on the next slide. Certain of the names are derived from a rude resemblance which the whole nebula presents to the head, snout, and jaws of, and they say monstrous animals, but I, I tend to say a fish. It looks like a, a tropical fish. So these are the names um, that Herschel put on the Orion Nebula. And actually it's kind of fun when you go out observing um, to print this out and uh, carry it with you and try and identify some of these features. And one of the interesting things, again, is called the trapezium. It's shown as four stars, but depending on the aperture, I think uh, you can see six and very large aperture, you can see more stars in there. That's sort of in the heart of it. The prominent dark bar that reaches westward almost to the trapezium, it's called Sinus Magnus, um, <clears throat> and it, it's Latin for the Great Gulf. Um, Herschel, we recall, had made his detailed 1826 drawing of the nebula in hopes of detecting eventual changes. He made a second study 11 years later. <clears throat> I think that's right. 1826, 1837, during his expedition to South Africa. As a preliminary, he determined the position of 150 stars in the nebula with a five inch refractor to ensure accurate placement of nebulous features as drawn with his 18 and a quarter inch reflector. His conclusion from a comparison of his work at these two epochs was that the Orion Nebula was virtually unchanged and any differences being mainly due to inaccuracies in his earlier drawing. William Cranch Bond, the first director of Harvard Observatory, was 57 years old when the 15-inch refractor <clears throat> was mounted in June 1847. This instrument surpassed Herschel's reflector in effective light gathering power and was far more convenient to use. The following winter, Bond paid close attention to the Orion Nebula, which he believed could be resolved into stars on the best nights when its brighter portion seemed full of points of light. Otto Struve was also investigating the Orion Nebula with a 15-inch Pulkovo refractor, a twin of the Harvard instrument. Because Struve criticized William Bond's work, the latter's son and successor, George Bond, undertook a new and elaborate visual study to vindicate Harvard Observatory's reputation. This work continued with some interruptions from 1857 to 1865. With the Harvard 15 inch, the nebulosities of Messier 42 and 43 could be traced over an area of 2.3 square degrees. Um, so George Bond could see a lot more. The Pulkovo was only 0.12 square degrees. Um, Bond determined the relative positions of 1,100 stars in the nebula. One of his assistants in this work was Asaph Hall, later famous as a discovery, discoverer of the satellites of Mars. Hall recalled years later, I have a very distinct recollection of how cold my feet were when he was making his winter observations on Orion. I sat in the small alcove of the great dome behind a black curtain where he could use a light and noted on the chronometer the transits of stars when Professor Bond called them out. And I also wrote down the readings for the declination. Sometimes I was called to the telescope 
to examine a very faint star or some configuration of the nebula. Professor Bond had one of the keenest eyes I have ever met with. And that's this photograph here. That's a, it's a detail of the actual drawing. G.P. Bond's engraving of the Orion Nebula is perhaps the most faithful of all visual depictions. Slightly reduced in scale from the original, the area shown here, 22 minutes of arc, da 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 da, da. Okay, Bond did not live to publish his work on the Orion Nebula. During the winter 1864-65, as his tuberculosis progressed, he strove anxiously to compete the manuscript. After he became too feeble to hold a pen, he continued to dictate until February 1865, the day before his death. This work was edited by T.H. Stafford for publication in the Annals of Harvard College Observatory. Um, so this is not as good a reproduction. Um, I got it from eBay. I bought a reproduction like this that was torn out of a book. And it, it's a really beautiful, delicate thing that looks more like that. But by the time it got to eBay and I copied it. So this is the, the whole drawing um, by G.P. Bond of the Orion Nebula. Um, And that's a better view. I mean, what an astounding thing. And look at that right angle. Like, come on, that can't be until you go to your telescope and you take a look under dark skies and there it is. Um, fortunately, Bond's famous steel engraving of the Orion Nebula uh, that forms the frontispiece of that book was completed before death. It is characterized as follows by Edward S. Holden, who was both Bond's cousin and a later authority on the nebulae. I am acquainted with but one drawing of the nebula, which is entirely above criticism, that of the late G.P. Bond. He was himself a skilled artist, and he had been familiar with the nebula for 15 or 20 years. He made scores of drawings in white on black and the reverse in colors, etc. Each of these was revised and re-revised many times. The final drawing in watercolor was copied by Mr. Watts, a skillful engraver, who himself was extremely familiar with the nebula. From repeated views and studies of it, knock it off. Where are we here? Why is this doing this? No, I got up, sorry. It won't be full frame if I don't do it like they want. Oh, wait, I got it. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, sorry. I don't want to have to start from the beginning. So we'll go to here and then down to here and then L and then there. He made scores of drawings in white on black and black on white in colors. Each was revised and re-revised many times. The final drawing in watercolor was copied by Mr. Watts, a skillful engraver who himself was extremely familiar with the nebula from repeated views and studies of it through the Harvard refractor. The revisions of the original plate lasted many months and I have myself examined from 15 to 20 final revises of the plate. Color, form, and relative brilliancy were all successfully and exhaustively criticized, and Professor Bond expressed himself as fully satisfied with the plate in every essential feature. That quotation is from Holden's monumental monograph of the central parts of the nebula of Orion published in 1882. 
At the US Naval Observatory, Holden had used the 26 inch refractor between 1873 and 1884 for the last of the great visual studies of the Orion Nebula. He was, Holden was particularly interested in the possibility of changes in small structural details. He made many comparisons of the relative brightness of various nebulous patches, sometimes with a crude visual photometer. These observations were supplemented by micrometer measurements of positions and orientations. He was also aware that the nebula was rich in variable stars for the bonds had noted slight light changes in the stars, some of the stars. Sorry, I saw this get weird again. Question. Yes. I, I am not sure. Um, yeah, he ended up at the U.S. Naval Observatory, but it doesn't say where he was before that. And I'm sorry, I, I'm I don't know the answer to that. Does it, you ask too many questions. I, there's a lot of stuff I don't know the answer to. But a good point. I'll. Oh, right, the day they discovered the universe, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Well, wow. Yeah. So this is back to the uh, Truvalo drawing. So this is Holden's 230 page monograph it was also a remarkably complete history of the Orion Nebula, for he went to great pains to collect the earlier counts and pictures of it. Here you can read, it's 230 pages, and it's all the other people who looked at it and wrote about it. Here you can read, for example, what Messier said in his own words, Holden managed to obtain photographic copies of some important unpublished drawings such as J.F.J. Schmidt's remarkably detailed view of the Athens Observatory refractor. Unfortunately, with few exceptions, Holden has reproduced all of these pictures as woodcuts. Holden's study of the Orion Nebula ended when he left the Naval Observatory to become director of Washburn Observatory in Wisconsin. And practically simultaneously, photography intervened so powerfully that no one since has followed in the footsteps of Herschel, the Bonds, and Holden. How's that for a story? Let me see if I can get this up there again. So um, here's the cool thing. I found this on the web, Edward Holden, professor of mathematics, US Navy. And here's the table of contents, uh, Huygens observations, it's like the third thing down, Hook, um, Picard, Long, uh, Washington drawing, Messier's observations, Herschel's observations. It's all here, you can download it from the web if you want to, fall asleep quicker at night. Um, but what, a, what an astounding thing. So these are uh, just some drawings of the central portion uh, of the Orion Nebula. So you saw the beautiful, uh, beautifully toned wide angle view of the nebu nebula by Leopold Truvalo. And this is just the central area with the right angle. So I thought it would be fun to see how did other people draw the central part. And keep in mind, this is reversed because I showed you that. So all of these are reversed in case you're trying to compare with memories of some of the other ones. Um, oh, this is the same drawing. I found this drawing. And then this is the same drawing, but oriented correctly and with 
better reproduction. And then Heinrich de Rest. And you'll notice that the, um, what was it called? I'll call it the fish mouth. They're the same. They're on the left middle of each of these drawings. And then this is Lord Ross, and I've forgotten what he drew that with, but I think it may have been the 72-inch uh, telescope that he had. Um, it's a, astounding to see the differences. Um, I'll point out these three lighter lines, and I'm not sure if that's a negative. That's a, this is a negative drawing. Um, so there's three lines about in the same place um, in the Durest drawings. Um, and it's interesting because they have these sort of well-defined pathways. And I haven't looked at Orion in a while, but I don't think we'll see those. I think we'll see more like what Truvolo did in the wide angle drawing. Um, What's really cool, there's a book, where is it, um, called Visual Astronomy. I'll show you a picture of it. And the author of that is, um, where'd it go? I forgot his name. Clark, I think. Um, so that's the... Uh, central region again and notice this doesn't have really hard-edged pathways um this book was i think published in 89 or something like that maybe 90s um i forgot wait a minute when did he do this he did this drawing in 83 richard clark from hawaii um but notice how subtle it is compared to those hard sort of black and white uh, parts of the right angle piece. Um, this is what we will see in the telescope. Of course, this is reversed. And here's Richard Clark's whole uh, Orion. And this is more what we will see. So there's, there's plenty of things to look at. It's always astounding um, to see that right angle piece and then when you use a higher power and you go into the trapezium and try and see six star, the four or six or more stars there. But then what we start looking for are these edges of the, um, the tropical fish. I think that better than monster. And just for the heck of it, um, I reversed his drawing um, so we could see what that would look like. So what should we be looking for when we view the Orion Nebula? So uh, this is one of the books that I used that um, some drawings were taken out of. In fact, I'll show you one of them. This was the first book I ever bought, the Messy A, a album, and it's, um, um, I think I bought it in 89, and it's still available used. And two people, uh, one of them was the sketch artist, and he sketched every Messier object, and his partner who lived in Arizona, I think he lived in the east, the partner in Arizona, photographed it with a couple of different telescopes. So this is the drawing of the Orion Nebula. Um, let's see. They don't have the names. It's Malice and who's the other one? Kramer. Mal Kramer and, Mal and Malice. Um, a very conspicuous dark wedge called the fish's mouth. From both sides of the wedge, great luminous bands curve away forming a ring that can be traced through nearly to its full circumference. It shows a little bit here, but it showed a lot more in the, in the Hubble photographs. But the trick is 
um, hopefully from a dark sky site, you can try and see how much of that nebulosity you can see in the upper left quadrant uh, of this drawing. Uh, Visual Astronomy of the Deep Sky by Roger Clark. He did uh, two of those drawings. Okay, where do I want to start? I'm going to start with uh, Kramer and Malice. Visual appearance. Here's one of the most remarkable areas in the heavens. So many details are visible even in a small telescope. It is difficult to make a realistic drawing. We're not going to draw. We just want to look. The uneven surface brightness, fine filaments, and mottling near Theta Orionis, and that's one of the bright stars in the trapezium, are very hard to depict. With the Malice four-inch refractor, powers from 25 to 60, and those are fairly low powers, give the best general views of the nebula whose greenish glow fills the entire field. A very conspicuous dark wedge called the fish's mouth. Uh, from both sides of the wedge, great luminous bands curve away, forming a ring. So that's what we try and see are those are those bands that curve away. Do not expect to see all the features of the Orion Nebula on a first inspection. With favorable sky conditions, growing experience will reveal many delicate contrasts. The, trape the trapezium region should also be viewed with high powers. With 200 and 250X on the four inch, the wedge appears faintly luminous and its edge twisted. And then um, Richard Clark, the Orion Nebula is easy seen in the middle of the sword of Orion as a fuzzy star. Curiously, its haziness is not mentioned in ancient records. The first known discovery was by Nicholas Piersek in 1611. It is very pretty in any instrument from binoculars to the largest telescopes. M42 is 65 arc minutes in diameter twice the diameter of the full moon. This is, I hadn't seen that before. I didn't realize based on that, how large it is, twice as wide as the full moon. Um, the average surface brightness of the Orion Nebula, average is 21 magnitudes per square arc second, the faintest parts are dimmer and the trapezium region very much brighter. This large range in brightness is difficult to photograph and most pictures overexpose the trapezium, the bright part. The eye has a larger dynamic range than film and given good skies can see the faint and bright portions of the nebula at the same time. The detail visible in the Orion Nebula is truly spectacular. Here is one of the few sights in the sky that when seen through modest amateur telescopes impresses even those not excited by astronomy. The intricacy is beyond description and even after hundreds of hours viewing this nebula, it still remains a beautiful and wondrous sight. Many stars dot the trapezium region. The four brightest are the famous multiple star system, Theta Orionis. They form a trapezoidal figure that inspired the group's name. The four stars are easily resolved in small telescopes um, and their magnitudes range from fifth to eighth magnitude. Two additional components are easily resolved I'm sorry, from eight to nine, eight, seven to 19, two arc seconds. Oh, the magnitude's from five to eight. Two additional components shining at 11th magnitude can be made out, of, out with a six inch uh, telescope in steady air. 
The fainter regions of the nebulae contain many loops of nebulosity familiar from photographs. They are visible in moderate sized amateur telescopes. And then here's a really interesting thing. Blocking the bright area around the trapezium makes the detection of the red in the outer regions easier. And I assume that they mean that you would move the field of the telescope to exclude the trapezium. And then without that brightness, you, we would see more detail. So filters. Um, this is a Lumicon UHC, and it looks like a mirror. Um, if you look at it this way, the UHC is on the left and the oxygen three is on the right. Um, and it, these are made up of many layers that are deposited in a vacuum. Um, here's what they look like when you look through them. And the UHC or ultra high contrast filter reduces the contrast killing effects of light pollution caused by artificial and natural sources. And the background sky becomes darker, increasing the visibility of your favorite deep sky objects. Sky glow, which is caused by neutral oxygen in the atmosphere, as well as light from high and low pressure sodium vapor lights and mercury vapor lamps are suppressed significantly, which means you can view or image from areas of heavy light pollution. While a filter is not often required to view the Orion Nebula, a narrow band nebula filter is awful helpful in bringing up the contrast and showing a lot more of the fine outer detail than the nebula has, that the nebula has. A narrow band filter like the UHC works very well for M42 and so does the oxygen three filter. However, they blacken the sky background to an extreme degree and are less suitable for a small telescope. So a UHC is a great um, uh, one to use maybe in a six inch telescope. I usually don't use the oxygen three, which is a stronger filter until I get to my eight inch telescope. Um, these are some of the books that I used. Um, for photographs and so on. The Messier objects, Stephen James O'Meara, the Atlas of Messier objects, uh, Ronald Stoyan. The end. Whoa. This is crazy. Oh. Right. Oh, everybody's still here. That's good news. <laughs> hey, Lordy. So are there any questions from anybody? Yeah, uh, Ken? Yeah, uh, that was good. Uh, I just want to mention about the trap uh, uh, trapezium. Um, I think that four stars, I think only two of them are variables. Uh, are, are, are you aware of that? Because they change the brightness as much as one magnitude. I don't know how many days or the periodic change, but uh, they, it just contain a variable stars two of them of the four trapezium stars. I think you had a question. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Hang on one second, I think. <laughs> um, I was not aware of that, Frank, but my brain is full from all the stuff that I found so oh. far. Um, yeah. Any other questions from home? Because we have a couple of questions here. So if I just went outside, hold that a little close. That's good. If I went outside and like could identify the the stars of Orion's Belt, would I be able to see any of this? I mean, it wouldn't look in those details, but can you see it without binoculars or a telescope? Any of it? In dark skies, you can see it with the unaided eye. Um, here, 
uh, binoculars would show you more. A telescope will show you more, but right now the moon is is up, and yes. um, so it'll be better in another couple of weeks or a week or so. Good. So, um, We're talking the, about really dark skies, though. That one's been around here, right? Well, I'll tell you, um, Steve Bellavia has been talking about going to Orient, not Orient Point, but Orient. And a couple of us went out there um, two months ago. And the difference from Custer to this boat launch, launch ramp in Orient is astounding. So that's, I'm not going to go to Custer anymore. I'm going to take the extra 20, 30 minute drive to get to the boat launch ram and uh, i don't know is any what's that okay carl's been out there to image so that's the new dark sky did did you have a question oh okay fred uh, let me get the microphone for you thank you this is so people at home can hear have they ever seen any differences in the space in between like Betelgeuse and Rigel? I don't know. I mean, that would, I don't know if there was proper motion with those stars, how long it would take. I mean, what is it? Barnard star has the, the most proper motion that we can see. And still that's really hard to measure. So, but I don't know about what was it, Betelgeuse and Betelgeuse is about 500 some odd light years, maybe 420, 520, and Rigel is 900. So, you're not going to see those things change to the spacing. Oh, thank you for that. You're still sharing your screen. Um, um, but that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. I need to see everybody. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Duh. Just call me Mr. High Tech. You have any technical questions? <laughs> Come to me. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you all who came. Thank you all who showed up at home. And as, as they used to say, I forgot who used to say it. Talk amongst yourselves. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was a great nice. presentation. Um, I, I didn't think you can talk so much about uh, the the great nebula. Um, can are you still there? Yeah. Um, hang on. Let me unplug this thing, and then do the other thing. Oh no, that's not good. Sorry. Don't go away. Um, there's a lot more that could be said about the Orion Nebula. I'm sorry, hang on. Wireless microphone output headphone. Okay, I think we're working. Uh, George, what were you saying? Uh, I said that, that was a great presentation. I, oh, I thank you. There, there would be so much to say about the Orion Nebula. And, and now Sam said there is a lot more. So I think there's going to be part two. Uh, right, Sam? Maybe someday. But what was not said yet about the Orion Nebula? It's very interesting to go through the rigors of trying to see the fifth and sixth trapezium stars, which requires an exceptionally clear night that's also an exceptionally steady night 
which on account of clouds <clears throat> hardly ever happens. Hang on one second. I will magically reappear. I think you can stop recording. Oh, thank you. Recording, stop.